Hello everyone, welcome to ECE 6520. Today is our lecture number 17. Okay, so let's briefly uh, review what we have covered in the last lecture. Uh, in the last lecture, we basically talked about three topics, right? So now we're in chapter seven, which is the capacity, channel capacity and channel coding. Right, and uh, the first topic is we finish up the last example of the channel capacity, which is the symmetric channels, right? And then uh, we consider the general the channel capacity, right? Which uh, means that we need to uh, we complete a convex optimization problem, right? And we introduce the theorem of that. Okay, so what is the condition of the what is condition of the general uh, channel capacity? Okay. Then we talk about the jointly typical sequences or joint AEP, right? So this basically means that instead of a single var random variable, we consider more than one random variable, right? Okay, for the symmetric channels here, so the definition of symmetric channels is that uh, in the uh, channel transition matrix, right? So each row is a permutation of the first row and each column is a permutation of the first column, right? So, and um, in this case, so one example of such channel is the additive noise channel, right? Which is something like that. So Y is a received signal and X is the transmitted signal. And then we have a noise term here, right? And this addition is over a finite field with sets Q. Basically, it means that this addition is a modulo Q addition, okay? And uh, given that, we can show the channel capacity is given by this form, right? So uh, log y, <coughs> the cardinality of y means that so this is the uh, cardinality of the output alphabet, right? And uh, this r is the entropy of uh, every row of the channel transition matrix, right? Because uh, every row is a permutation of uh, any other rows, therefore they're the same, right? So this basically means the, the entropy of a single row there. Okay, and sometimes symmetric channels is called strongly symmetric channels, right? So this means that we have also definition of a weakly symmetric channels, right? And there are a number of definitions for the weakly symmetric channel. Here, uh, we pick the, the weakest one, right? So this means that so we only require that every row is a permutation, every row of the transition matrix is a permutation of the first row. And we do not have any constraint for the column here, right? Therefore, so this capacity is basically, we can obtain this when we derive this, right? But we cannot do any further derivation because of uh, we do not have any constraint for the rows, right? And here, basically, instead of the log, cardinality of y, here we have a maximum of this entropy of y over uh, the distribution of x, okay? And the second term is the same. All right, so this is the symmetric channels. And then we cover about this optimization theorem, right? And as we can see that in order to find the channel capacity, what we would like to do is to solve this convex optimization problem, right? And uh, we know that if we fix the, this transition matrix P, and then the neutral information is a concave function of this P, right, which is a distribution or PMF of X, okay? And, uh, and uh, when we solve, so we basically use the standard convex optimization technique to solve this, which is a KKT condition, right? But you don't need to uh, really understand the KKT condition here. So, after applying the KKT, KKT condition, so we can obtain the following theorem, right? So the following theorem basically tells you that, so for the optimal distribution of Px, right? So we have, when the optimal distribution is bigger than zero, then we basically need to uh, make sure the mutual information between x, which is fixed, and y is, is a constant. Right? And otherwise, if this guy is less than that, then we just, uh, uh, we, we just, uh, so Px, uh, Px star will be zero, okay? So this basically means that we could partition all the 
input alphabet or all the input letters into two categories, right? So in the first category is where this p star x is zero, right? And in this case, you know, we should not, you know, this basically means that we should not give any probability weight uh, to those letters because they are bad, right? Because the mutual information between those letters and the output is less than, than C prime, okay? But for when the p star x is bigger than zero, okay? So this basically means that this mutual information is a constant. So we should, uh, so, so this should not, uh, so this basically means the good letters, right? So we should, uh, because their mutual information are identical, right? We should give those uh, the weight for those mutual informations, okay? So, yeah, again, so this means that we should only use good letters and don't use any bad letters, right? So this is a kind of an interesting uh, result, interesting conditions, okay? And uh, we give an example of the Z channel in class where the Z channel is not really symmetric and it's not that easy to solve it by hand, right? So we just apply this theorem for the Z channel and find the optimal, I mean, find the conditions of the distribution of X, okay? Great. And, uh, and then we introduce the concept of the joint typical sequences or uh, the joint, uh, the joint AEP or the joint typical set, right? So the definition here is almost identical as before for single random variable, right? The only difference here is that we need to make sure that uh, so this satisfy for x and this satisfy for y, and this also satisfy for both x and y. Right? Those three conditions have to be satisfied simultaneously. Okay, and then. Uh, we can see, we can derive some nice property of the joint AEP, right? So the first the three properties here, so they are pretty much the same as we have seen before, right? The only difference here is that instead of one random variable, and then we have two random variables here, right? We have, you know, the two random variable here, right? The, 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 you know, the, the PMF for X and Y has to be roughly uniform, right? That's why it's called AEP, right? equal partition and then so the cardinality of this guy is basic upper bounded by this number and oh here should be x and y right instead of x so i will correct that later and same thing here so here should be x and y so i will have upper bound lower bound they are almost identical okay and uh, the interesting property is the last one right here is so this means that okay if we have another pair which are independent but we have the same marginal distribution with x and y, right? So there, in this case, so it means that, so, so those are accidentally in this AEP, the probability, those are accidentally in this, a, in this set is basically upper bounded and lower bounded by roughly this number, right? By the neutral information, okay? So, we're, so this is pretty important that we're gonna use this to show the, 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 the channel coding theorem, okay, the achievability part, right? Okay, great, so this is what we have covered in the last lecture, and um, so in today's lecture, we have two topics. Okay, the first topic is that we're gonna prove the channel coding theorem, and this proof is very important. And um, so it's like uh, the proof for the source coding problem, so this so in this proof, we have the direct part or the achievability part and the converse part, which is the impossibility part, right? And both of them are very, very standard technique that you know, we're gonna use it later in our class, okay? Proof of the channel capacity theory. Okay. And the second part is that we're gonna look at a specific kinds of channel codes, which is called zero error codes. Right, because so far we have we have focused on the codes with a symptotic error, right? But we're gonna see that zero error is indeed possible for DMC. Okay, very good. Okay, let's get started. First, let's talk about the proof of channel coding 
Yeah. Right. Let's recall the the channel capacity theorem, right? <clears throat> or the channel coding theorem. Okay. So this is for again for DMC channel. Okay. So basically, the theorem tells us that the capacity C is the, we need to take the maximum over the distribution of x. Then, so this is a mutual information between x and y, right? Okay. So in order to show this theorem, we need to show two parts, as, as we said before. The first part is the direct part. Okay. The direct part is basically the achievability part, right? It means that we need to uh, derive a achievable scheme to show that so this is this is indeed achievable, right? Okay, great. Okay, so yeah, that's the our objective here, right? So what we need to show here is that we wish to prove that for any rate r is less than c there exists a sequence of rn code rn codes with vanishing probability Okay, so this is basically what we would like to show, right? So in other words, so we need to compute, uh, construct scheme, compute the probability, show that it goes to zero as n becomes large. Okay, and uh, so the, uh, so this is not that easy to show in general, right? So one of the channel's greatest contribution is to give you a totally different idea here, right? So the idea is called random coding. Okay, so according to what we wrote here, so uh, so what we would like to do is to give you a specific construction of a channel code, right? And then we show the probability will goes to zero as it goes to infinity, right? However, constructing such a code is extremely challenging, right? So it may not be doable, okay? So, so this is the essence of the random coding. So, so, so the idea of random coding is that, uh, so uh, instead of constructing a specific code, so we don't do that, right? We do not construct any specific codes, right? So we randomly generate uh, some codes, right? And show that the average probability of such codes will go to zero. Okay, and then we derive the maximum probability will also go to zero for a specific code. Okay, let's see how we can show that. Okay, so the idea of random coding is that instead of building a specific family of codes, okay, and then normally so this is very, very difficult. Right? Actually, that is most of the cases are still open uh, today for the simple channel. Okay, very difficult. Okay, so what we would like to do is that we average over a random ensemble of codes okay so we randomly generate the code right know that so this is not an explicit construction so it is like okay in the end so what we are going to show is the existence of such code okay you'll see the details so but we still do not know the is the explicit construction okay it's kind of magic right so we know there exists such a code that we can achieve the capacity, but we don't know how to construct them explicitly, okay? So let's see how we can do that.
okay so the idea is relatively easy okay to describe so basically what we would like to do is that given the px right let's fix the input distribution px right and we generate uh, the code book randomly okay and independently uh, given this r okay and after generating the code book, and we know what is the number of codes we're going to have, right, which should be equal to the number of input messages, okay? And then we can do the transmission, right? And when we receive, uh, when we receive the corresponding code, uh, receive the corresponding messages Y, then the decoding approach is very easy. So we just use the typicality decoding here for the channel codes, which means that we need to find the uh, joint typical sequence of X with Y, okay? So if we can find one of this pair, then we can do the successful decoding, right? So if we cannot find one uh, such pair, right? If there's no such pair, or there are more than one such pair, then we claim error, and that's it, right? That is the coding approach, okay? So let's, um, uh, yeah, let's see the details of that, okay? So the first step is to generate the code book, okay? So this is that we fix PX, right? And uh, so generate a, a large coding matrix, right? Like, as we have said before. So because this is the number of, total number of input messages. Remember, this is basically capital M, okay? Uh, times N code book, right? This n is basically the length of the input block, right? So we're considering block channel code here. So the input length is always n, okay? So we denote this code book as c or cn to indicate the length of the code, okay? So we're gonna uh, randomly generate this code book at random, okay, with ID entries distributed according to PX, right? So this is very easy. So it means that now we have such a big matrix, right? We have this number of entries and uh, we have this number of entries, right? And uh, so now we have a number of rows and each row is basically a code, okay? And together. So we have this number of rows, okay? And um, so this is basically the code book generation, right? And um, so when we do the encoding, so basically we're gonna do the mapping from the input message to each of the rows here, right? So the message, let's say if we index messages as one, two, up to, to the power to mi, right? And then basically we use this code word to represent this message, this code word to represent this message, and so on, right? So this is basically our x1, so this is our x2, and so on. So this is our x to the power of mi, right? So this is an encoding procedure, okay? So let's write down carefully. So before that, so, uh, so the code book has to be known at both transmitter and receivers, right? Because in the transmitter, we need to you know, send the code and at the receiver, we need the code book for the decoding, okay? So one assumption here is that the code book is revealed to transmitter and uh, receiver before communication take place takes place okay and uh, for the encoding part as we just said so this is our encoding code word so this is basically m is a message right so this is this code word is basically the m's row of 
the gener generated code. Okay, here m is in the set of m, right? And the set of m is nothing but one, two, up to this, right? So this is the encoding part. And for the decoding part, so it's also straightforward, but this is the most uh, the most technical part, right? So this is called the joint typicality decoding. Right? Know that if you study communication, so this is not uh, what we use in practice, right? So when we do the decoding communication, so normally what we use is ML decoding, right? Maximum likelihood decoding. Okay, we don't use those kind of decoding. So, so this is a purely mathematical tool that can make our analysis much easier, right? So ML is very hard to analyze. Okay, so let's write the details of that. So we let this Y to be the received message. Denote the received observed channel output. Okay, and then, so we're gonna claim the decoding, right? So we're gonna say GY, okay, we have a um, Two cases, one is correct, the other is an error, right? So if we say this m hat, that is of course in the message set. So that is our decoded message, right? So if this is the unique index such that so x m hat and the y so they are in the typical set joint typical set okay when we receive y then we're gonna find we're gonna go over all the possible code word and uh, find a corresponding code word that is joint typical with y okay and the corresponding uh, message and hat is the decoded message right and now we can see that so so uh, what are the error error event right so one possible error event is basically that the correct m hat i mean the correct i say xm so it's not joint typical with y right so that's a possibility and the other uh, error event is that something else besides m can be a t joint typical with y, right? Therefore, so, so otherwise we declare an error, right? So we're gonna see the error event in detail when we compute the error probability. Okay, very good. Okay, so so given the, the coding and decoding approach, so now and here, remember that we fix our rate R here, right? We're going to see the condition later for R. But now, what we would like to do is to analyze the error probability. Okay? So ideally, what we would like to analyze is that fix the code book, and then we analyze the maximal error probability. Right? That's the, the definition according to the channel capacity, right? So, however, this is very hard, as we said before, right? Because we have no idea about the code book, right? The optimal code book, okay? So here, we're gonna use advantage of the channel coding, where the code book is randomly generated, right? So this means that what we're going to compute now is the expected average error probability, right? Where the expected is, is over all the possible code book, right? We want to show this error probability will go to zero, and then we can claim that there exists a code book that will have to go to zero. Okay, otherwise altogether cannot go to zero. And then, so we're gonna find the maximal uh, error probability given this specific code book. Okay, so our next step is to analysis of the expected 
average probability of uh, of error okay and here so this average is over all the messages right okay and this is expected is over all code books right because those are randomly generated okay so next let's analyze uh, the expected average probability of error okay remember that the average uh, error probability is denoted by something like that as we have seen before but here for the c we ignore the, the n here okay but now we want to do this expectation over all the possible code words okay and uh, by definition so this is nothing but we do summation sum over all the code words and the compute the probability of such a code book i mean not code book, code book right so c is a code book okay and then yeah here we need to indicate that is a function of n as well because we need to show this will goes to zero as n goes to okay and this is basically the definition of expectation so now let's write the definition of the average error probability this guy right so as we said so this is the average over all the possible message right so this means that is equal to this guy right and from one to this number and inside we have our so this is notation that we used before for the individual error probability right but now let's emphasize that is a function of the code book okay now let's see how we can compute this guy okay so yeah what we're going to do now is that so normally when we have these two summations so we can somehow exchange them right and see what will happen so we do the same thing here so basically let's change the order of the summation and see what can happen okay all right let's look at uh, this term okay so the meaning of this term is the average error probability for message n over all the possible code book which is randomly generated right so this basically means that this quantity is not a function of n right so all the messages are symmetric are the same right so so this means that we can replace this n by one here okay Okay, and uh, then, so let's uh, manipulate this. So because now we, so this is not a function of M anymore, right? So we can basically this and that can be canceled, right? So what we get is this, PRC and multiply P1C. Okay, and uh, what does that mean? Right, again, so as we said, this is nothing but the probability that so we have an error which means that the decoded message is not one and given the fact that m equals to one one is sent right so this is because of the property of the random coding right so this is very important okay so okay so this is basically uh, the error probability right so next we're going to analyze that right so first of all we would like to uh, let this guy goes to zero and the C. Okay, so let's see what is condition to make sure this guy will go to zero. Okay, so let's let the event E to denote this error event. So this is not one. Okay, so let's denote the
conditional error event. Okay. So now let's see what can cause errors, right? As we said before, we basically have two types of errors. One type is that the x1 and the y are not, are not jointly typical, right? Because we're sending x1, right? And the other type is that there are some other uh, axes that are jointly typical with y, right? In detail. So it means that uh, so the error event can be written as b1c. So this is the first type of the error, where, which is x1 is not joint typical with y, right? So this partition of error event is, um, is pretty important, right? It depends on, so, that'll, uh, so it, it, that will determine how we're gonna compute the error probability, right? And we denote e2, e3, and um, so on. until e to the two, e, uh, two to the power n r. So this basically means that uh, other messages can be joint typical with y, okay? Where, let's see, b1, so this basically means that x1 and y, so they're not jointly typical, right? Okay, and uh, the other event EI is XI and Y. So some other message uh, rather than one, uh, they are jointly typical. Right? For I bigger than or equal to two. Okay? So you can see this C basically means that it's not in, right? If it's in, then there's no C. Okay? Okay, great. So this is basically the way we're gonna partition the error space, right? And given that, so now we're ready to compute the, the average uh, expected error, uh, error probability, right? So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna use union bound in probability, right? So which means that, so this probability Right, so which is basically this one, right? That means error, right? So we're gonna uh, divide this into two parts. One is this, and the other is the rest, right? So basically, the probability of a union of event will be less than or equal to, right? The the probability. Uh, let's see, this is nothing but the error, right? So that will be less than. Or Let's say that will be equals to, let's write it out. That is E1C union E2 union up to E to the power of NR given N equals to one, right? And by union bound, this will be less than or equal to PREC. And then we add the rest, right? So we're gonna partition the rest as well. Right, we're gonna write them separately again by union bound. So basically, we can write them separately, right? Okay, so next is that we're gonna bound for each of them, right? So we're gonna bound each of them separately, right? Okay, so note that since this guy, so I mean this, uh, let's see x1 and y1, so those two are uh, the, the two random variables, right? So these two random variables, so they are jointly distributed in an ID fashion, right? So since they are jointly distributed according to a product from F, Okay, and uh, so this means that we can use the joint AEP property or the jointly typical sequence property and by the joint AEP property. So yeah, this one, so is like uh, we're going to use uh, the first property here. 
for right. So the the probability that so this is a, this is a probability that they are in the typical set. So that follow that will goes to one. Therefore, it means that the probability that they are not going to be in the typical set will become zero, right? So then we can get u one c u. So that will go to zero as n goes to infinity. Okay, or you know we can write this is less than epsilon uh, for any epsilon for sufficiently large n. Right? Okay, so this way then we can bound the first guy would be less than or equal to epsilon, right? So that's relatively straightforward. Okay. And um, and the second part is a little bit trickier, right? Okay, let's see. So for this one, this basically means that I see the definition of EI here. So this is so they have to be jointly typical for some other i, but actually i equals to 1 is transmitted, right? Therefore, it means that they are independent, right? So, but the, 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 the marginal distribution will be the same as px and py. Okay, we have to be careful here, right? So this e1, c, and ei, they are randomly invariant, right? So here we should write a random variable here instead of generalization, right? Okay, it reminds us this property of the joint typical sequence, right? So basically, if x, y are independent, the probability that they are in the typical set is basically given by this. Okay, so this is basically less than or equal to, and let's count number of terms here, right? So that is 2 to the power of n r minus 1, and for each term, it will be less than, uh, less than or equal to this guy. Neutral information minus this okay and um, so we can see that uh, you know this one can be this one can be ignored right that is less than or equal to this guy multiplied okay and then we could combine this to get n i x y minus r minus three epsilon Okay, very good, and uh, and therefore, so we can write the the upper bound of the average expected average probability, right? Hence, for any epsilon bigger than zero, and also for sufficiently large n, right? And then the expected average probability of error right over all the possible code book that is less than epsilon add this one right okay very good and uh, now let's see so once this probability will go to zero as n goes to infinity right as how can we make that happen so this epsilon goes to zero as n goes to infinity already right for, su for sufficient large n and how about this guy, right? So here, we need to make sure that this guy will be bigger than zero, okay? And then that will go to uh, zero, right? So this basically means that we need to guarantee that R is less than the mutual transformation between X and Y minus three epsilon, okay? And for simplicity, we say for sufficient large N, we can make that less than or equal to epsilon as well. Therefore, so we can make sure that this is less than or equal to that equals two epsilon. Okay, so and uh, okay, so in therefore we can see that if we satisfy this condition, then we can make sure that at least the expected average error probability will go to zero. All right. Now we will need to go from considering uh, all the possible code uh, code book to a specific code book and go from the average error probability 
to the maximal error probability, right? And uh, so far, you know, by uh, uh, by getting this, so we can have the following observations. Okay, okay let's say so. Consequences. Okay, and the first consequence is that, so as we said before, so here considering for any n, right, there must exist a code such that its error probability is not bigger than every one, right? So this means that for any n, there exists at least one code that performs not worse uh, than the ensemble average. Ensemble average. Okay. Okay, so so this property basically allow us to going from all the code book to one spe specific code book, right? Okay, and the secondly is that so so here basically this will hold in general, right? So basically, uh, so this means that so we can choose p x to maximize that and let r less than that, then we're still fine, okay? So second property is that we can choose Px to maximize this guy because the inequality we obtained before holds for any Px, right? And um, so the last uh, comment here is that, so if we see this, right? So here we can see there is a three epsilon instead of epsilon, right? So here the point is that the constant doesn't matter, right? As long as n goes to infinity and epsilon uh, goes to zero, this guy will go to zero, okay? So basically this means that this three epsilon vanishes by considering smaller and smaller Absolutely. Okay, great. So now we're ready to, 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 to go from the average error probability to the maximal error probability, right? From average to maximal error probability. So the way we do that is called expurgation. Okay, so we're gonna expurgate some of the code words, right? Okay, so as we said before, so we're gonna first of all we're gonna pick a specific code book, right, with the error probability that is less than F, less than or equal to epsilon. Okay, so we fix an epsilon, right? That can be arbitrarily small, and uh, so we let this C N star be a code with this P E N every error average error probability that is less than or equal to two epsilon, right? As we have shown before. Right? So here is less than or equal to two epsilon. But there must exist a code such such that this condition satisfied. Right? And um, and here we're gonna pick the rate right, would be less than C minus two epsilon, right, so that is, so to make sure the average error rate will go to zero, and then, so we're gonna sort the error probability, right, sort the code word such that, so we're gonna rearrange it to make sure the first one has the best error probability, and second one is the second best, less than up to P 
PE, right? Okay, we're good. And, uh, and uh, so after this sorting, so we're gonna get rid of the worst half of the code, right? So for simplicity, we assume that an R is an integer, of course, right? So, and uh, everything works out, right? Be fine. Then it's purgated code as we have a new notation here. Let's use C tilde, okay? C tilde star, right? So denote uh, C tilde star n. So denote that as x1 up to x2 to the power of n r minus 1, right? We just uh, want half of them and then we throw the other half away, right? So this is our new code book, okay? So this basically means that we use the best half of the code word, okay? And then we could uh, see the maximum error probability, right? Because we throw half of them away, and then now if we use this code, so this code word will give us the worst error probability, right? That is the maximum error probability. So we denote this as E P E max, right? And the C N star tilde, right? So that is basically equals to this guy, right? Okay, and we claim that this would be less than or equal to four epsilon. Okay, so let's denote this as a star. And let's see why that's the case. We have a short proof of star here. Okay, so actually proving that's relatively uh, easy, right? Because we have this ranking here. Right, less than let's write the middle part, which is this guy, C n star, and less than two n r minus one plus one, C n star, and so on, less than until the last one. So that's the previous code book C star, right? Okay. So now let's assume that so this is bigger than for epsilon and the same thing every one is bigger than for epsilon okay and let's see what happened right so so then we can see the summation of all of this so if we do a sum right so what we're gonna get is that this sum will be bigger than so number of terms is this one plus one right and multiply for epsilon, okay? Or that equals two, uh, let's say two to the power of n r plus two times two epsilon, okay? And now because of that, we could compute the error probability of this guy, right? We know that is less than two epsilon before, right? But now if we have this assumption, let's see what uh, do we get for this guy, right? So this, uh, is basically equals to this, right? And uh, we know this number of terms of this guy will be bigger than for epsilon, right? Therefore, we can see that. So this would be bigger than one over two n r times this. Right, it's like we throw everything before this guy away, right? So then we have a lower bound, and here this equals to one plus times two epsilon, which is bigger than two epsilon, right? In, right? Therefore, it's a contradiction. Okay, therefore we can conclude that so this guy is less than or equal to four epsilon, right? Okay, very good. And uh, so after that, so we can see that, uh, so now we consider, a, so let's compute the rate of this new code, right? So for this new code, 
and C and Q that star, right? So now we know this that the highest, the, the maximum error probability goes to zero, right? In the rate of four epsilon, right? And then let's see the rate here, right? For this code, let's say I denote the rate as R tilde, right? That equals to one over N log is two. The number of code word here is this guy, right? And that equals to one over N times an R minus one equals to R minus one over N. Okay, so that's a, the, the rate of the new code. Okay, therefore we're, we're, we're almost done, right? So now let's consider this um, this this code, the C tilde N star. So that is our constructed code in the end, right? So we show that we, there exists such a code, right? We didn't construct it, but we show there must exist such a code, right? Therefore, so we can see that we have constructed, right? Not really constructed, but you know, constructed um, in a probabilistic manner, right? A code C and tilde star of rate R tilde equals to R minus R. Uh, R minus one over n with maximal probability of error of P E max and uh, this new code. So that is less than or equal to four epsilon, right? And then we're done. So basically, we're finding a code. To achieve this rate, right? This one over n can be ignored because as n goes to infinity, that term will go to zero, and then the error probability will go to zero. Okay, so we're done. Okay, so this is basically the achievability part, right? You can see that it's kind of tricky, right? There, it involves lots of new ideas of using this random coding technique, right? Which is very very important in information theory. Okay, great. So now. Let's take a look at the proof of the converse part, right? Proof of the converse. Right? So in order to prove a converse, it basically means that we need to show there exists no cause with r bigger than c and uh, r b arbitrarily small error probability okay so that's basically the meaning of the converse right there's no code such that R is bigger than that with arbitrary smaller probability, right? However, so in the proof, we're gonna show another equivalent statement, right? So in the proof, basically we see we see that it is more convenient to prove another equivalent statement, right? The following equivalent statement, right? As we said before, right? In the um, when we talk about source coding, so converse could be one of the most uh, challenging part in information theory. Okay, so basically, what we're going to show here is that. Uh, so we assume that such a code exists with the maximum error goes to zero, right? Therefore, uh, R has to be less than or equal to C, right? That is, you know, the other way to, st to say the same thing, okay? So suppose that a sequence of Rn codes C N 
exist such that so now we consider the average error goes to zero right and then it must be r is less than or equal to c Note that here, we consider this average error probability equals to zero, right? So that is a stronger condition compared to the maximal uh, error probability equals to zero, right? Which means that if the uh, maximum average, uh, maximal error probability equals to zero, it will imply that vice versa is not true, right? So this is a stronger condition, so we're fine, okay? So in order to prove it, so we need to first let the message and uh, following a uniform distribution on the message set uh, right and this basically means that m will follow a uniform distribution between one up to this guy right this assumption right so we're going to prove the converse under this assumption okay and uh, now, if you remember the source coding theorem, or I mean the converse of the source coding theorem, we have like one, two, four steps, right? Uh, here, similar, we also have some similar steps here, okay? And you can compare between these two. The first step is that because of the uniform distribution, so we're gonna write this equation, right? NR basically equals to the entropy of HM, which is equal to log M, right? So that's the first step. Okay. The second step is that we're gonna make the part of the neutral information, right? So it basically means that we're gonna minus this guy and uh, add this guy back. Okay. So the advantage here clearly is that so this is the second step. So is that here so we're gonna have the neutral information term, right? Which is something that we want. Okay, so maybe I will write the steps uh, in color to make it more clear. Okay, first step and second step. Okay, and um, and the third step is that so we're gonna use so so mutual information is a term that we really like, right? So but uh, this term is something that we don't want, right? Because after all. We're gonna say this guy will be less than some neutral information between x and y, right? So that is not something that we want. But this, what was the meaning of that, right? We can see that the meaning of it is that, uh, given the observation, then we're gonna see what is the uncertainty of the original message, right? So this should remind you about funnels inequality, right? So basically, we can prove it by funnel, right? Funnels inequality okay so we can show that this guy is actually less than or equal to one plus uh, this uh, p p e bar n times n r okay so that's basically directly use funnel if you don't recall let's go back to to, to see the funnels inequality okay therefore we can see this guy is less than this guy plus one plus okay so you can see find that now this is something that we sort of like right because later on we're gonna let the p goes to zero right this term will basically disappear right I see so this is so this statement is what we want to show right we're gonna let this guy goes to zero later okay and uh, this is our third step use funnel okay use funnel is our third step Okay, and the next step, step four, is that uh, we're gonna use data processing inequality to show this guy is less than or equal to xn and yn. Okay, so this is data processing inequality because we know the relation is from m to x to y, right? That's a Markov chain, right? Then Therefore, we can use the data processing 
in your photo view. Okay, it's all this. All right, so that is our step four, use data processing. Okay, so step five is that, so now this term should not be a troublemaker, but uh, this term is still a troublemaker, right? Remember that this is not what we want, right? So this is kind of like a multi-letter expression for the channel capacity, right? It's the neutral information between xn and yn, right? But what we do really want is the mutual information between X and Y, single letter. Okay, let's see how we can um, get that. Okay, so let's take this guy out right here. So let's show yeah, this guy. So this is again standard operation. So this basically uh, equals to HYN minus HYN given XN, right? That's the definition of neutral information right and then so where we can use chain rule uh, to expand this part right so that's summation from i from i to from one to n and then we can have yi given y i minus one remember this notation basically means that from y1 till y i minus one right and then given xn okay and now remember that so we're operating on a discrete memoryless channel right this basically means that yi only depends on xi right therefore we can get rid of everything but xi here okay so this basically equals to yn minus yi given xi right this is because of the dmc property okay and uh, now remember that so what we want here is the upper bound instead of the exact value here right so this basically means that we can use the the entropy bound to bound this guy right so we can separate them right the joint entropy can be bounded by the summation of the individual entropy right then okay so given that now it's clear right so we can combine this two to get this guy and clearly this is the definition of neutral information right that equals to um, neutral information between xi and yi right we're almost done right this is something that we really like Okay, so this together is our step five. We need to get the single letter expression. Okay, great. Okay, given that, so now let's go back, right? So now we know n times r should be less than or equal to this guy plus this guy, right? Let's write it down. n r should be less than or equal to sum over neutral information yi plus one plus pn bar uh, pe bar n times r uh, n r okay and then so by definition so we know that so each of this should be less than or equal to the channel capacity right therefore this together would be less than n times c plus 1 n p e bar n the reason is that uh, the c is defined as the maximum entropy uh, over px right therefore so each of these should be less than c okay very good and then we're almost done right from here we can uh, we can see that R should be less than or equal to C uh, plus 1 over N, right? Let's divide it by uh, N on both sides plus P E N times R, okay? And uh, and clearly, so we're gonna, now we're going to let this guy goes to zero and N goes to infinity, 
right? Therefore, we can see. So maybe we can write it here. Instead of here, write the let p n bar goes to zero and n goes to infinity. Right then we can get so r should be less than or equal to c. Okay? And uh, and then we're done, right? So basically now we show that uh, the, the rate has to be less than or equal to the capacity, right? Another way to look at this is that uh, also from this inequality, we can derive a lower bound of the error, right? So the average error, that is the bigger than or equal to one minus C over R minus one over NR, okay? And we can see that if R is bigger than C, Right, if R is bigger than C, and this guy would be something uh, between zero and one, right? And uh, now we can see the error it will be bounded away from zero. Okay, so this basically means that 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 guy will be larger than bigger than zero for all n. Okay. Now we finish the proof of um, the converse part of the channel coda theorem, right? And uh, so. So you can see that I spent lots of time on proving the achievability and the converse of the um, of the channel coding theorem, right? So this is um, pretty standard, and you can see all the techniques that we apply here, right? It's not easy at all. It's pretty complicated. Okay, great. So next, let's take a look at a specific uh, channel code, right? So we call this zero error codes okay so so basically what i've shown so far is that we allow asymptotic zero error probability right so they may not be exactly zero but asymptotically zero okay so here so what we would like to consider is the is the case that we require the exact zero error probability right so we have given an example before uh, about the noisy typewriter Right now, we're gonna look at the example again and see something more interesting, okay? So let's first take a look at the definition, okay? The definition of the zero error code, okay? So here, we say if for all m that is the message set, which is from one to up to this guy, right? And then the error the individual error per v is required to be zero, okay? And then we say that the code denoted by, denoted by C0 is uh, zero error code, okay? So straightforward definition. So now let's take a look at an example about the zero error code, right? And this, the example we're gonna look at is the same example that we have seen before. It's a noisy typewriter, okay? So noisy typewriter is something like this, right? So now let's consider a case where the input of a VAT and the output of a VAT is the same as from zero, one, two, one, two, three, four, instead of A, B, C, D, right? And here we can see that, so the channel is, is like this, zero, one, two, three, four, zero, one, two, three, okay? And the transition probability is like this, right? So one letter with some probability will you know the input and the output will be the same or it can go to the next letter right okay and then the last letter will go back okay so now let's consider the simple case where all the transition probabilities half right doesn't matter but it's you know and so on right okay and now we can write the transition matrix so that is given by this, right? I think here 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then 
So the probability from 0 to 0 is half, from 0 to 1 is another half, and the others are 0. And then we can fill this out, right? So it's like this topless structure, right? And then half. Okay, very good. So that is basically the uh, the transition probability, right? And as we said before, right? So in order to design the achievable code with zero error, so basically what we can do is as follows, right? We just pick this uh, this guy and this guy to do the transmission, right? You can see that if we transmit this guy, the the, the only possibility here are those, right? And if we transmit those guys, the only two possibility are those. Right, and if we only use these two letters as our input symbols, and then we're fine, right? That will be no no error because when we see zero or one, we know zero is transmitted, and when we see two or three, we know two is transmitted, right? So, so in this case, <coughs> it basically means that from zero, we can see uh, zero and one, from two, we can see two and three. Right, and uh, if we only use zero and two to transmit the source message, in this case, our code length is just one, right? Because we only transmit zero and two. There's one symbol. The code length is one, right? And then the code book is nothing but zero and two. Right? We only use these two letters. We don't use uh, one, three, and four, right? And given that, so we can see the the, 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 the coding rate, right, is uh, R is basically log C, right, over N, which is one, right, that is basically, let's say it's log two, okay? Let's say if it's uh, based on two, then that is basically one, right? So every single time we just can transmit one bit without any error, okay? So, but uh, you can see that the performance of this code may not be very good, right? So can we design something more interesting? Right, the answer is yes, right? So, so uh, from source coding, so we have seen that uh, there may be some advantage by using a longer block to do the encoding, right? So before we consider n is one, so how about now we increase our n such that n is two, right? So from here, uh, we can basically see something very interesting can happen, right? Let's consider, uh, let's draw a figure like this. So it has to be two dimensional, right? Because we consider n is two, right? So it means that we can transmit two symbols together, okay? Zero, one, two, three, four, okay? So we're gonna draw this grid. So every grid basically represents two numbers, okay? Okay, right, for example, this grid represents zero and zero, okay, and um, <clears throat> and uh, this grid represents one and two, okay. So now let's see, uh, is there any advantage that we can construct a zero error code when n is two, right? For example, let's say, how about zero, zero is a code word, right? We can fill our code word here, right? Let's say zero zero is one of the code word, and we know that so one so one letter can only go to its right, right and down by one unit, right? Because zero can goes to one, and one uh, zero can, zero can goes to one here, and zero can goes to one here, right? And both of zero zero can goes to one one, right? Therefore, so we do not want to use this guy, this guy, and this guy. Right, so there might be some confusion there, right? So, so it means, but if we do not use this and this and that, then we can safely transmit zero and zero. Okay, same thing here, right? So this basically you can see the, the pattern here, right? So once we want to transmit something here, and then we have to make sure maybe use another color. So we have to make sure that, so this big square Right, this big square 
can only contain one cold one. Okay, so the same thing here as well. Okay, you see the pattern here, right? So basically, one possible design is as follows. So we can design the code word in such locations, like one here, one here, and one here. Right, so we cannot pack anymore. You can double check, right, for this guy, you can see this, this, and this, and that. There's no any other code word, right? And for this guy, we should consider this square. Okay, and for this guy, we should consider this two and uh, this two. Okay, and with that said, so those are the best we can do, right? So now, given this, the code word is given by zero, zero, one, two, right? One, two is this guy, and this guy is two, four, right? And uh, this guy is three, one, and the last guy, this guy is four, three. Okay, so now we can see that, so we have five candidates here. Right, so this basically means that, so the rate, uh, the rate now equals to one over two log five, okay? So clearly that is bigger than one bit, right? So in other words, so we can transmit, uh, we can transmit Uh, this number of bits over two channel uses. So this means that there are some advantage of using more, uh, using a bigger block, right? So, okay, so we have an improvement in this case, right? Okay, great. So this is zero uh, channel code, right? So but how about um, how about in general, right? So what is C zero in general? A right? zero code, a zero error capacity. Okay, so we introduce the following theorem. Okay, so let C zero be the highest possible rate of a zero error code and then so what do you think the relationship between c0 and the c the channel capacity okay so intuitively c0 should be less than or equal to c okay and uh, let's prove it okay it's kind of obvious but we still need to prove that okay Move. So again, we'll let n to be a uniform distribution, right? This is a message, right? So basically, the step will be the same as before, and you can see, right, how we can sort of repeat in the same step, but with some difference here, right? So it's a little bit easier, right? Again, first step is to write this as the entropy. Then second step is identical, right? So we're going to minus this term and add this term back okay and now we can see the easy part right because of zero error so then this will be zero because after observing y we know m exactly without any zero okay therefore so this equals to the mu transformation using this tool and again next step is to use the data processing inequality to get this Okay, and next step would be the same, right? Because of the DMC property, so this is less than or equal to. Okay, and again, because C equals the maximization of this mutual information over PX, so that would be less than or equal to N times C. Okay, therefore, we can get R is less than C. Okay, so, because r is less than c, then we can see the c naught is equal to the maximized of r, that will be also less than c. Okay? And then we'll finish the proof. 
Okay, this is relatively easy. Okay, great. So this is what we want to cover for today in our next lecture. So we're going to cover the last part of chapter seven. So which is the feedback capacity and the joint source channel coding theorem. Okay, great. So let's end for today. Please let me know if you have any questions or comments. Please stay safe and healthy. So I'll see you next time. See you. Bye-bye.